Good evening. Hi. Good evening. This is Nicolina Nix, and you're here for another episode of Women, Wit, and Wine. And I have my, again, blessing me with his presence, amazing guest, Eddie Tafoya. Although, is that, is your book Eddie Tafoya? No, my book is The Marxist Revolution. No, 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 no. Is your book, your, your, your name on your book? That's what I'm asking. The so name. you're not your author name. Your your my writer author name. name. My real name. My home. My the name everybody calls me is Eddie Tafoya. Yeah, I know. Okay, so like if I pick up your book, it's gonna say Eddie Tafoya on it. It's gonna say Eddie. Okay, Tafoya. that's all. That's what I wanted to know. I just wanted okay. to make sure that I had it. If you right. pick up any of my books, it's gonna say Eddie Tafoya. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. It's named after my grandfather. It's gonna say Eddie Tafoya. It's a lie. I picked up your last book and it didn't say a word to me. Well, that's because you didn't read the deeper levels. <laughs> if it starts talking, I'll let you know. <laughs> it's got, it, it'll speak to your soul. It will speak to my soul. So we're here to talk about your books. So, how, okay, I'm going to ask you this. How many books have you written? I've written five. Okay. And your very first book was? My dissertation. Okay. And it was called? It was called... Parfitino's uh, novel about fixed points in space-time. That has nothing to do with my subject matter here today. So let's forget about that. It was stillborn. I hate... No, there were some good part, parts of it that it got published. But then I wrote... Th then I published a book mm -hmm. called Phenomenological Approaches to Popular Culture. I was one of the co-editors. And I wrote an essay on... On um, Robert Persig's novel, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. I began the, my, my chapter. So you can work on my motorcycle? I can work on your Zen. <sighs> so my chapter began with a long extended discussion about the most important people who ever lived, the Marx Brothers. Mm -hmm. But I edited that book. Then my next book was called The Legacy of the Wisecrack. Stand-up comedy is the great American literary form, where mm -hmm. I look at stand-up comedy as an American literary form, as a literary form, like the poem, the play, the novel, the short story, the essay. Well, well sure, it's, it's, it's definitely an art in itself. It's an art, but it's a literary form. Yeah. And then my novel, my, my, not my novel, but my, the book I wrote after that was... Uh, called Icons of African American Comedy. I was actually commissioned to do that. And it's Portraits of 12 African American Comedians. So have you, uh, here's my question. That, that's a really interesting uh, subject because um, have you ever thought about doing a the documentary about it? About what? African American? From your book. Which book? The one you just talked about. I just talked about three of them. Okay. Well, not like a sea of a wisecrack, but the other one. You said you examined African 12 American African comedians? American comedians. No, I haven't. Have you? I mean, think about it. I mean, if you thought about it. Because, you know, um, I don't know, recently on... Do you have Showtime? I have Showtime, yes. Or was it on Stars? But there, did you see the series on the Comedy Club? That was on CNN. No, it's a documentary about the comedy store itself. Oh, about the comedy store. No, yeah. I didn't. I it's amazing. Asked. You should watch it. And I just think, you think that, that for a lot of people, I think the the background and the history of, of of comedians and where they're coming from and how they got to, to where they are would be interesting. And from your book, you could pretty much do a documentary, even if it's just mostly voiceover about, you know, the comedians and clips from the comedians and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I think that would be interesting um, because uh, I think Ken Burns could do a great job with American comedy because Ken Burns, you know Ken Burns, right? The name is familiar. Ken Burns, Mark Twain, Jazz, Hemingway, Baseball, Florentine Pictures. Is this all literature stuff? No, it's PBS. Okay. Okay, how often do I watch PBS? Not often enough, apparently. Apparently often, not often enough. Do, unless Doc Martin's on, and then that's totally different. Okay, so so you don't know about Ken Burns' Civil War series? I probably do, but anyway, I don't know. Yes. I just okay. finished Hemingway. He is on a search for the American soul. The, the highlight, the high point, for me at least, mm -hmm. and I'm a big Mark Twain fan, 
and I'm a big uh, Hemingway fan. But the high point of Ken Burns' work was the miniseries he did on jazz, on the history of jazz. Mm -hmm. It was mind-blowing. So insightful. I, Ken Burns is searching for the American soul. That's what his stuff is. So maybe, maybe, maybe you should reach out to them. Maybe I should. And say, because I think it would be fascinating for people. I mean, considering where, where we've come from in being, I guess, and the word I don't particularly care for is the woke community. Um, I don't want anything to do with the woke community. But, but you know what I'm saying? But, but under, understanding the, the method from how people got to where they were, how yeah. your care, how your, how your comedians got to where they were. Right. Yeah. Well, but comedians, you got to understand, Nikki. Comedians are an expression of their society. It's not just individual wills at work here. The society produces the comedians. Well, you know, and and and, and I say, and I agree with that because I was actually. Reading, agree that so I'm right. Whatever. I was reading <laughs> something today that I wrote about about who I am and. And, uh, you know, and it was, it's an old, it's something that I wrote some time ago, but it was just like about who I am and just the, the stuff that I've endured growing up and not so much as, but it's, it's what makes me who I am when I'm on stage talking about comedy. So like for me, um, a lot of people hear my comedy and go, oh, you talk about sex a lot. Okay. But that doesn't mean I'm a whore. <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that's ridiculous. Yeah, but it'd be ridiculous to draw that conclusion. But sadly, people people hear that and think that oh, I must be easy, and it's like no, no, no. This is just this is this is my past that's made who I am today, not so much who I am right now. And you know, and 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 I've had friends that listen to it go, I don't know you at all, and I'm like, understand, the comedy is an extension of me. But is but it is not me. Comedy is the comedy. The persona of the comic yeah. is a caricature. Mm -hmm. It's not a true self revelation. Right. It's, there's some self revelation involved, but it's a caricature. So, when you wrote, I'm going to bounce all over the place because this is what I do. This best. is what Nicolina does. Yes, it's what I do best. So when you wrote this book. And actually, I think... Which, which, which book are we talking about? The one we're talking about, The Marxist. Okay. We just jumped from icons of African-American comedy to The I know. Marx Brothers. But yet, that's what people love about me. Okay. <laughs> but when you wrote this book, and I, and, and I think that you were working, you had started this book when you and I started first hanging out and yes, yes. getting to know each other. Um, and then you just kind of... It dropped off for you for a while because you couldn't find it. And you said you couldn't find your groove. Right. I couldn't find the groove. And plus I was moving. And So when, how, what motivated you to find your groove? Uh, one day, okay, here's what happens to me when I write books. I don't know if your audience cares about this. But I write a book and then go into this extended period of stasis where I can't, I can't write a grocery list. I can't read anything, can't write anything. Mm -hmm. I just burn out. But then I come back, right, and start writing again. So once I had moved, I, I was living in Las Vegas, New Mexico for 20 years, God forbid, and which oddly enough is where my dad, where both my parents are from. But um, I moved to Albuquerque by back to the home of my birth, the home that, the home of my heart, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I'm. And I'm living in the North Valley. I'm from the North Valley. And I'm like, yeah, I can do this. So I started putting together all these notes. I've been, I was 58 years old at the time. And I basically had been working on this book about the Marx Brothers since I was 10. The first time I saw their 1931 film, Monkey Business, I was engrossed in the Marx Brothers. And that film just changed my life radically, obviously. And so I started working on it back in 2016. Mm -hmm. 
Oh my god, that's been a long time ago. Yeah, it was a long time. <laughs> god, I'm getting old. <laughs> Just kidding. And I worked night and day, got a sabbatical from my job, from my professorship. And I worked night and day. I mean, there were times <coughs> when I would wake up, get to my computer at 7 o'clock in the morning. And I would break for the, break for the day at 9.30 at night. Mm -hmm. All I did was... I mean, I was so focused, so engrossed in this. Yeah. But the writing process isn't what's important. Well, I mean, I what's think important the, is the product. I, I also think that, okay, so I did a poetry book 10 years ago, and I hate it. I, I, it was amazing, and people t liked it. And, but then I read it one day, and I'm like, this is terrible. <laughs> And I'm I, think, like, I think writers do that. And so, like, I I, I uh, started editing it, and I've been editing it for 11 years. <laughs> well, yeah, that's the way it goes. It's right. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, but there's this part of me that says, ah, I just really want to get it done. I just really want to get it done. And I, and, I, I, and I don't. So when I wrote that, I wrote that when I was in a lot of pain. Like, emotional pain. And so, like, because that's where my writing comes from. It wasn't from. because of me, was it? Yeah, 11 years ago. Did you know me 11 years ago? No, I didn't. There you go. So, I was in a lot of emotional pain. And so, like, my most of my writing comes from 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 that that that, that hole that you dig yourself in when no, you're yeah. in that moment. I really didn't think you were writing about me. I, I know you weren't writing. I don't think I caused you emotional pain. There was this one time at uh bank no I'm just kidding. <laughs> at bank camp. So but uh so I, I mean I can kinda so I understand that because you know not that I'm saying oh I'm I'm a huge art author, but I am a writer. I do write. I know you write. Um You do a lot of creative things, thank you. I know, I'm all over the place. It's like, you know, I'm a plethora of messiness. But don't you want to know what the book is about? I would love to know what the book is about. Okay. But, you know, because I did read your your synopsis on on it. Is that your... So, for in, in, in film, it's a treatment. What's it called in a, for a book when it's you... It's a synopsis. It's a synopsis. Okay. Yes. See? Oh. Right. Prospectus. Prospectus. To okay. me, it's the same thing. So. Okay. Here's the premise of the book. All American literature comes out of, I mean, not American literature, American comedy. All American comedy comes out of the Marx Brothers. All modern American comedy comes out of the Marx Brothers. Is it because they were physical? Their comedy was physical comedy. No, there's physical comedy going back to, going back to, the, you know, street performers after the fall of Rome. Physical comedy has always been, the, 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 physical comedy has always been there. Mm -hmm. No, the Marx Brothers were not primarily physical. Harpo was. They're pri they're primarily verbal. Is that the guy with the horn? Wah, wah. That, you don't even know who Harpo Marx is. I don't. I got a text message from his son the other day. Mm -hmm. Did he go wah, wah? Yes, that's exactly <laughs> what he did. In his text message. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> no, they were verbal. Okay, but it... And people don't realize this because most of us are not aware of comedy and what it was like before 1915. Okay, there is an American, stu American Studies scholar, perhaps the first American Studies scholar, mm -hmm. and her name is Constance Rourke. Mm -hmm. And she writes this book in 1931. Well, she publishes this book in 1931, and it's called American Humor, A Study of the National Character. Yeah. And what she's doing is she's looking at American humor and analyzing the culture through the lens of humor. Right. And she says American humor begins around 1815. And she's taking a cue from um, she's taking a cue from uh, Bergson, Henri Bergson, the great philosopher, the great French philosopher. And she's saying that American humor cannot begin, Americans cannot produce their own humor until 1915. 
country began in 1776, but it uh, isn't until 18, I said 1915, but I meant 1815. American humor, America began in 1776, but it isn't until 1815 that the country has stabilized enough that the people who live in the country can begin to see themselves as works of art. So American humor begins in 1815. So between 1815 and 1915, which is a really, really crisp, clean uh, epoch there, there are three modes, three modes, comic modes that dominate the entertainment landscape. They are minstrel humor, Yankee humor, and frontier humor. Let me start with with Yankee humor. Yankee humor is stories of the Yankee, of the Yankee peddler who goes from town to town to town. Okay. To town. So is that like the vaudeville stuff? No, it's before vaudeville. Okay. Well, I'm just kind of trying to, you know. Okay, but but I'm understanding. Okay. I'm learning. <laughs> okay. The more you know. The the Yankee humor is where we get traveling salesman jokes. Mm. You know, traveling salesman jokes. Mm -hmm. That that whole joke cycle. But let's forget about them. Because it's a little bit too hard to explain and too obscure. And if you don't live in New England, you don't know what Yankee humor is. But we all know what minstrel humor is, right? They're like the gesture, court gestures. And... No. Oh, no. I guess Gee, you don't know. Apparently, I don't know. Everybody else does, Nikki. You're, you're the last to learn. <sighs> is that where I go to church and I tell jokes? No. Minstrel humor is minstrel humor is people putting on blackface makeup. makeup. Oh, okay, now I know what you're talking about. It's like fun. Al Jolson and... Well, before Al Jolson, but yeah. But, but I, I know, because, you know, I mean, because you had the segregation then, and so, like, you didn't really have a lot of ethnic performers. So people right. would make themselves look ethnic in a poor makeup way. Right. right. <laughs> well, Al, Al Jolson was Jewish, but... Uh, anyway. Yeah, I know he was Jewish. Okay. But... Uh, in the way minstrel shows began is in the slave slave cabins of the pre Civil War era, mm -hmm. the antebellum South. You had these natural entertainers who were slaves, and they would started making fun of the white people, their masters. Everything, the way they talked, the way they danced, the way they ate, the way they moved, everything. White people started making fun of the black people who are making fun of the white people. So mm -hmm. they're lampooning the lampooning. They start putting oh, on hilarious. they start putting on burnt cork makeup to make themselves look black. And before long, you have the first American entertainment craze, the minstrel show. Mm -hmm. And that basically lasts from basically more or less from the beginning of the 19th century yeah. into the 1960s. Okay. The third element here is frontier humor. The great practitioner, the great voice in frontier humor was Mark Twain. Mm -hmm. You have heard of Mark Twain. Well, of course I've heard of Mark Twain. <laughs> and Mark Twain. And it's stories of, of the, it's really the westward expansive. It's a, it's a, it is the humorous answer, the comedic answer to Manifest Destiny. Mm -hmm. So you have stories of people like Pecos Bill and Paul Bunyan. And well, that, I mean, what I mean, I guess that that's what I'm sitting there. As, as you're sitting there t talking to me, I'm sitting there. Is that what Bill Hillcock and <laughs> you had to get your gun? And <laughs> Frontier. Well, it's, it's the same. It's the same. It's but the same but those were more show. like gun show, gun show showing right. kind of things, not comedic kind of. Think of Davy Crockett, Pecos right. Bill, these guys. Okay. All three of these comedic modes, which dominated the landscape for a century, these three dominate the landscape for a century. And what they are about is humor is based on the world of the powerful. So it's so people are powerful. So the people making jokes are those in power. Mm hmm. So the, the white man who puts on the black face makeup to make fun of the to make fun of the, the, the black man is using his power to generate laughs. Okay. And people like Mark Twain and David Crockett are making people laugh because they feel that they're incredibly privileged. They can go from one part of the continent to the other part of the continent because God gave it to them. 
God gave the continent to them. Right. This is an attitude inherited from the Puritans. Okay. So, um, for the first century of its existence, American humor is a humor of privilege. The Marx Brothers come along. Does that mean privilege is in money privilege? Or... No, it means that if I'm a white male... You can do it. I feel like I'm blessed by God, and I can make fun of all the people who are... Of everybody who's not white. Who's not white and not male. And not rich. Mm. Okay. Well, maybe not even rich, but who is not privileged as I am. Mm -hmm. Okay. The Marx Brothers come along. They start lampooning, they start making fun of all these rich white people. And they're Jewish. Mm -hmm. And let me take a sip of wine and I'll explain this. Chaim. L'chaim. L'chaim. Okay, here's what happens. They take on these personas that really grew out of the Manhattan, the Upper East Side of Manhattan, Carnegie Park area of Manhattan, mm -hmm. where they grew up. Groucho is the fast-talking Jew. Mm -hmm. Jews, the stereotype of Jews is that they are swarthy, they're hairy. So Groucho has the big mustache, the big eyebrows. Mm -hmm. The other stere another stereotype of Jews is that they're um, fast-talking. And Groucho is definitely fast-talking. Well, they're a bargainer. You know, they like, you know, they gotta go back and forth. There you go. That's where the term Jew you down comes from. Yeah, that's a really racist... But you know what I'm saying. It's like exactly it's, it comes saying. because they're they're bartering. They're going back and forth, back well, and forth. You know. Well, the Jewish Jewish people and, have a and very, I don't mean that in a racist manner. I just say that's a bad. That's but a term. but the Jewish Jewish people have a very Jewish culture has a very very long com uh, commercial tradition mm -hmm. going back. You can trace this back to the Book of Genesis. So Jews have the reputation of being stingy and money grubbing people. You mm -hmm. know, they're miserly. Well, no, not miserly, but they, yeah. they don't they don't hold on to their money. Yeah, they want a good bargain. Well, that that's a, it's it has to do with commerce. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyway, Groucho uh, Groucho also has a cigar, a pretense of wealth. He has the coat, the the, the nice the nice suit. The... Well, it's not really nice. <laughs> it's a bad well, thing. you know, I mean, for 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 what. The time period is is it's the repre it's the presentation of being it's a pretense upper of echelon. It's a pretense of wealth. It's it's the pretense of wealth. That's he what has I mean. The claw hammer coat. Yeah. And then he has the the eyeglasses that don't have lenses in them, mm -hmm. so he's a pseudo intellectual. Chico has these hand me downs, this this misshapen fedora, mm -hmm. and he speaks with an Italian accent. So Groucho is the, is the is the Jew, Chico is the Italian. He mm -hmm. speaks with this mm -hmm. really bad Italian accent. With a bad Italian accent. Exactly. Yeah, that's just says like that. And then Harpo has these yellow curls, these blonde curls. Yeah. In 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 their first movie, um, in the first movie, The Coconuts, it's actually red. It's it, it, you can't so tell. It's more like clown red, like a clown red than the red. You know. Well, it's hard to tell because. Because it's in black and white. Right. The film's in black and white. So when you colorize it, it's clown red, I'm sure. But you, he pulls out uh, he pulls out a newspaper clipping from his pocket, and he hands it to somebody, and and it, and it, it's a, and the headline says, be on the lookout for silent red. So he has, the hair is He's supposed to be red. He's silent red. He is silent red. But he is the caricature, he is the caricature of the dumb Irishman. So you mm -hmm. have three outsiders coming in, and in monkey business, um, what they're doing is they're sneaking into America in the hull of a ship. So it's like the Mulligan stew coming into the yeah, that's in, exactly in, into the United States. And they, <laughs> and they start making fun of all these rich white people, mm -hmm. which in terms of American culture, especially in terms of American college, uh, comedy, is radical. It changes everything. And today, to this very day, American comedy... Is a comedy of the outsider making fun of the insider. This is Kevin Hart. This is Amy Schumer. This is Angela Johnson. This is um, uh, Trevor Noah. This is John Oliver. Bill it's Burr. Pete, what's that? Bill Burr. Bill Burr. Certainly, it's people. It's people who don't have a lot of power making fun of people who do have a mm -hmm. lot of power. 
-hmm. that couldn't have happened um, 130 years ago. Right. But it happened because of the Marx Brothers. So my film looks at how the Marx Brothers basically sweep in and basically reconstruct the DNA of American comedy. Hmm. Have I talked enough? No. Okay, what else do you want to know? So is it pu is it on? Can you, can, can you buy it yet? You cannot buy it. We're still looking for a publisher. It's been sitting on my agent's desk for a while. Hmm. You want me to put a like a flame under his ass for you? Would you please? I could. I could. So far, I've talked to several people who might endorse it. Mm-hmm. One is Bob Stebbins. He's a major humor scholar. He's not a comedian, but he's a humor scholar. Mm -hmm. And for years, for the last 20 years, I've been having my students read his stuff in my stand-up comedy class. Yeah. And then um, another person who, who might give me an endorsement is Bill Marks, Harpo's son. Harpo's son, that's cool. That would be, that would be awesome. And then I reached out to Stephen Wright, because we've talked on Facebook before. You mean... They said breakfast anytime, so I went into the... You're, you're messing up Stephen Wright's joke. I fucking love him, though. Oh, he's, he's, he's number... If, he's you're number... Going, if you're driving the speed of light and you turn your lights on, what are they doing? Yeah. I, I like to... Stephen Wright! I went to a place that said breakfast anytime. And... Yeah. So I ordered French toast from, from, from the Renaissance. Yes. yes. See, I, I know I've messed it up. I don't care. I don't care that I messed it up. I'm just saying, I'm, I'm paraphrasing his joke... In my way. Okay. Jesus. Stephen what a Christ. I got a, I got a great Stephen Wright joke that I, that I spring on kids all the time. Okay, tell it to me. I go up to a kid and say, how old are you? He says nine. I say, yeah. By the time I was your age, I was ten. Oh, yeah. I, you, you tell me that joke all the time. I love that joke. <laughs> That's so funny. By the time I was your but age. But Stephen Wright is an outsider. Yeah. And he makes fun of people on the inside. Uh, he's very, very much in that tradition of Harpo Marx. Mm -hmm. he's, he's very deadpan. He's very deadpan. And I love that. But he plays with language. He plays with defamiliarization. So. Do you know what defamiliarization is? Mm, taking you out of the element? Where you take something... Some people say the purpose of art is to take the familiar and make it strange. Okay. And the data is, you know, Marcel Duchamp, the data is, you mm -hmm. studied art, didn't you? Mm-hmm. hundred you know, years ago. Do you know who Marcel Duchamp is? Mm -hmm. Marcel Duchamp was... If, a, I, if I saw his art, I probably would know it. Well, let me describe it. One of his pieces was called Mona Lisa with a Mustache and a Beard. Mm. He takes a print of the Mona Lisa and draws a mustache on it and a beard. This is in 1917. Yeah. And his most famous piece is probably called The Fountain where he finds a urinal in a back alley in New York City. He inverts it. He signs it, R. Moot, and enters it in, in a New York art show. That's hilarious. That's really hilarious. It's really funny. And so what he's doing is he's saying that art is not in the object itself, but in the way you frame it. I agree with that. I think most modern art scholars would. I agree with that, and it's just kind of like when you look at something, it's because what one person sees is not the other, what the other person sees. It's a matter of perspective, but and and what moves one person does not necessarily move another. Right, right. But I think what he was saying is art is a matter of choosing and reframing. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to paint a painting, I'm going to choose to put the cyan over here and the burnt umber over here and the mm -hmm. ochre over here. On the painting. The no. same way if I choose a urinal and say it's a work of art, it's therefore a work of art. It's in the framing. What mm -hmm. Stephen Wright does is he reframes. Mm -hmm. He reframes. He defamiliarizes. Uh, I defamiliarized my students just today. Some of your listeners may not like this, but um, I recall this incident because we're talking about about art, we're talking about Stephen Wright, and I'm showing them a, a Robert Townsend video. Mm -hmm. Do you know Robert Townsend? He's a singer. No, no. He's, he's a comedian. He's a comedian. Did Hollywood Shuffle? Then yes, I know who that is. Yes. Okay, showed him a, one of Robert Townsend's um, stand-up routines, where he comes. Maybe that was in, Pete Townsend. I was thinking. I'm sorry. Pete Townsend. Yeah, that's he's the lead man, front man for the Who. Mm -hmm. He wrote Tommy. 
Yes, I know. Okay, Robert That's Johnson. I'm allowed to get my uh, arts mixed up. Okay, what Robert Townsend does, and this is before anybody knew who he was, so the joke would still work with you. Um, it was a joke, Nikki. Anyway, what Robert Townsend does is he comes out and he's dressed very dapper in this no, press. No, I, I got that. Wait, what, do you, what are you telling me it's a joke for? I'm moving on. <laughs> he's, dressed with this, he's dressed with a scarf and very dapper and a hat. Mm -hmm. And a press white shoot. And he comes up, hello, hello, are you having a good time tonight? I'm having a very good time. I hope you're having a good time. My name is Robert, and I'm from Chicago, and I'm from the ghetto. I'm still that little old black boy from the ghetto. So the words themselves don't mean all that much. But the way he delivers them, the way he reframes them, creates the humor. Mm -hmm. It's a brilliant stand-up routine. And then Jerry Seinfeld. Jerry Seinfeld is brilliant at this whole defamiliarization thing. Yeah. Uh, in his first show on the Tonight Show, from 19, in his first appearance on the Tonight Show in 1982, he goes up there and he says, I was coming off the freeway today and saw the sign that said, right turn, okay. I love that. What are they saying? We're not crazy about the right turn, but... Okay, go for it. We don't like it, but it's okay. Yeah. I think they should take it further. Left turn, enjoy yourself, call us. That's hilarious. It's, he's, re, he's defamiliarizing that, that a sign that all of us see. Mm -hmm. um, the, the example I use for defamiliarization doesn't have to do with comedy. Was I relayed an actual event that happened to me. Mm-hmm. This was back in 2016, and I was going on this trip, and my trip got delayed, and I mentioned at a gathering of some friend, with some friends that I should have expected it, yeah, because Mercury was in retrograde. Mm -hmm. You know, when Mercury oh, yes, I know. seems to move backward to the sky. And astrologers say this is a bad time for contracts. You can't do contracts. You shouldn't get married. You shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't. Uh, you shouldn't sign, travel. You shouldn't travel. You shouldn't sign. You shouldn't sign any type of agreements. You shouldn't enter into buying a house. Yeah. Okay. So totally, totally not that. My aller, my uh, my allergy nurse turned me on to this, but that was years ago. But anyway, and and she said it was actually a time to. Fix old mistakes. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I tell this guy, yeah, I should have expected this. I didn't just threw that out there because Mercury was in retrograde. And this guy is a born again Christian. Mm -hmm. And I say, and he says, well, that's really stupid. You really believe in that astrology? That's really stupid. And I said, wait a minute. I didn't say I believed in it. I just threw it out there. I thought, it's mm -hmm. a good excuse as any. Right. And I said, but let's think about this. You believe, you believe that a perfect creator created imperfect beings that were so imperfect that he had to make himself one of them and have them destroy him mm -hmm. so that he wouldn't destroy them. And that makes perfect sense. And he says, well, that's different. And I said, how is that different? It's, it's much more ridiculous to me. Than my car breaking down because Mercury is in retrograde. All right. So I defamiliarize Christianity. Mm -hmm. And well, I mean, and that, and I think that, that that's good if you can do that. Um, I think we do that all the time. Stephen Wright. Stephen Wright does this all the time, and, and the March Brothers did it. But mm -hmm. uh, the way Stephen Wright did it was he would. Uh, See those numbers you take at the delicatessen mm -hmm. and defamiliarize it. Mm -hmm. I was arrested for scalping low numbers at the deli. I sold the number <laughs> two for 28 bucks. <laughs> and he, sometimes he takes it to other extremes. You know, I, I was arrested for walking somebody else asleep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Curiosity was a cat. For a while, I was a suspect. <laughs> He's... He's one of the greats. 
I like him. I like I, I like Stephen Wright. I do. No, oh, he's he's one of the all time best. So. Anyway, but we we're talking about the Marx Brothers. We were talking about the Marx Brothers. See, the Marx Brothers take immigrant humor to a new level. Mm-hmm. Before the Marx Brothers, immigrant humor was about people who were shoved off into corners, or even ethnic humor. Well, yeah. sure, you had neighborhoods that you shoved people into. Well, I'm sure you're a big Burt Williams fan, right? Nobody knows who Burt Williams is. Then why'd you ask me a question if I don't know who he is? I was being ironic. Okay. Or sardonic. Sarcastically ironic. Or belittling. Apparently so. Okay. Thank God I'm big. Thank God you're big. Ish. Um, let's talk about Chaplin. You know Chaplin, right? Mm -hmm. One of the great comic actors ever, right? The right. first cinematic superstar. Yeah. I mean, he was the first. I thought it was Buster Keaton, and then he did something stupid. No, I don't think Buster Keaton did anything stupid. Yeah, he I'm did. sure he did stupid things, but... Oh, no. He did something. Like career-ruining stupid mm -hmm. things? What did he do? Okay, what happened with Chaplin... Because of the, the sexual nature. Well, Chaplin married a 17-year-old girl or something like that. Eugene O'Neill's daughter. But anyway, what I was getting at was, have you seen City Lights, Chaplin's masterpiece? Mm -mm. It's a story of the, the little tramp, Chaplin's great character. Right. And... Oh, I'm sorry. It was Fatty Arbuckle. I'm wrong. Oh, Fatty Arbuckle. That's different. Okay. Sorry. I'm wrong! You've heard it on the air. Okay, I'm you've wrong. heard it. Mark this occasion. 737, Tuesday, August 27th. Nicola knew that she's wrong. Mm -hmm. Now I have to kill it. Okay, in City Lights, Chaplin plays the little tramp, but he's shoved off into the corner, and throughout this film, you've never seen it, right? I think I've seen it. I mean, I've seen some silent films, because it's a silent film. Yeah, but usually people associate modern times with Charlie Chaplin's masterpiece. It's not. City Lights is his masterpiece. Okay. This is just my humble opinion. But there are many, you know, film scholars who agree with me. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, in this film, he basically cannot be seen. Yeah. People don't see him. Ever. Um, he, so he shoved off into the corner. And the general, Buster Keaton's great masterpiece. Mm -hmm. um, it takes place in this obscure town in the south, in the woods. You know, and nobody sees him. In... And if you look at the five Marx Brothers film, the real, the films that really define their careers, um, Monkey Business, Horse Feathers, Duck Soup, Not at the Opera, and Date the Races. Mm -hmm. What you see is that they represent this emergence of the immigrant and the immigrant comedian into American consciousness. In Monkey Business, they're sneaking into the country in the hull of the ship in, in barrels, labeled mm -hmm. Kippered Herring. In uh, Horse Feathers, the 1933, 1932 film, um, Groucho is a college professor, much, much more visible position than any of these other comedians have had. Yeah, I mean, he's he's a college he's a college president, not just a professor. He's a college president. So the immigrant invades higher education. Mm -hmm. And in Duck Soup, the 1933 film, some people say it's a masterpiece, he is president of the country of Fredonia. Fredonia. And the, the, the national... That's my country. You have no idea. <laughs> How much truth you speak, Nicolina. That is my country. Fredonia. Where their national anthem is, Hail, Hail, Fredonia, Land of the Brave and Free. Does it sound like any other national anthem you've heard of? Uh, Fredonia. Are you drunk already, Nicolina? <laughs> no. I just want to say that I'm from Fredonia, because it sounds kind of cool. Well, Fredonia was, what in the in the 19th century, was a, a nickname for the United States. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I got what you meant by that. It says, hey, I'm held the line with a Okay, so imagine, um, imagine this. Just put yourself in the mind of a redneck. I know for you that's quite a stretch, but... Because you're woke. You're woke. 
I am not fucking woke. I don't want to <laughs> fucking be woke. I don't want to be woke. I want to be hilariously me in my own right and not woke. Okay. Let's say it's 1933. Unless I'm getting up. Let's say it's 1933. Mm-hmm. And you're some anti-Semitic racist living in Oklahoma City. Hmm. Sounds like my family. Okay. <laughs> You know, my dad's family's from Oklahoma. My mom's family's from Arkansas. You're going to have six of one, half a dozen of the other. I don't know. Okay, so you know exactly where I'm coming from. I know exactly what you're saying. Okay. You go into a movie theater. Mm -hmm. And you see this caricature. What color is my dress? Your dress is gingham. Blue gingham. Okay. Okay. I like blue gingham. Well, if if you're from Oklahoma, it's, it's a uniform. Okay, you go into a movie theater. Do I have a boyfriend? Yes. Does he have dungarees on? <laughs> yes, his name is Billy Joe. Oh, I've never dated a man named Billy Joe. Well, I actually did date a man named Billy Joe. No, his name is Bobby Joe. Bobby Joe. Okay, you and Bobby Joe. Bobby Joe, why? You and your gingham dress. Uh-huh. Gingham dress. Him and his gingham. dungarees. Him and his dungarees. You go into this movie theater mm-hmm. in Oklahoma City. And you see a story about a caricature, not just a Jew, but a caricature of a Jew. An exaggeration, a hyperbole of a Jew. And he is president of the country. How do you feel? Under most circumstances, you would say... Ha! That would never happen. That would never happen. This couldn't happen. (laughs) This is wrong. This is America, Bagum. Yeah. Bagum, we only like black people here. Jews, say, ha! And, and, that would never happen. And Jews crucified Jesus, right? Okay. Because Jesus was a Jew. Well, there's a great line from the little big man. Moses was a Jew and Jesus was a Gentile. Moses was a Hebrew. Sorry, he was a Hebrew. Okay, thank you, Nicole. Jesus was the Jew. Just saying. Okay. I will take you outside and fight you for it. I'm not. I'm not afraid of you. <laughs> you should be. I'm not as scared of you. you okay. Sca- you should be scared. Anyway, the point is, suddenly America gets this view of a Jew, but not just a Jew, a caricature of a Jew, in this position that is not just the highest power in the land, mm-hmm. but the highest power in the world. Mm-hmm. And that had to scare a few people. Well, I'm sure it did. But, thank God, the Marx Brothers were funny enough and likable enough that people laughed it off. Mm-hmm. And then, in the 1935 film, A Day at the Races, the very next, I mean, sorry, Night at the Opera, the 1935 film, Groucho is this impresario. And he's, he's looking for talent. For the opera. So we see this progression. They sneak into the country. They sneak into higher education. They sneak into politics. Now they're sneaking into business and the arts. Mm-hmm. And then in the 1937 film, A Day at the Races, which is underappreciated for, as far as I'm concerned. It's really a complex film. Uh, what they're doing, it, it, Groucho plays a... Uh, a veterinarian masquerading as an MD, which mm-hmm. is illegal. <laughs> <laughs> yes. He should get thrown in prison for that. But it continues the progression. So you go from sneaking into the country to sneaking into, po- into higher education to sneaking into politics to sneaking into um, sneaking into arts and business mm-hmm. to sneaking into science. It's, it's the story of these immigrants... And immigrant consciousness slowly taking over American culture. And thank God that's happening. But, and again, it's, it's again, what I, what I was saying is, like, it's that mulligan stew. It's just, like, when, when, when that, that key was is that America became a hodgepodge of people. Oh, yeah. And isn't that wonderful? I think it's amazing. I, I, for, for breakfast the other day, my girlfriend and I had... Um, oh, that's so cute. You say girlfriend. Well, my girlfriend and I had... I can't wait to meet her. (laughs) She'll love me. Or she'll hate me. But either way, 
I love her because she be, she makes you happy. Okay. We had uh, a green chili bagel with lox mm -hmm. and capers. Mm -hmm. I'm eating this bagel and thinking, I love my country. A place where you can get something from the Jewish tradition mm -hmm. and something from the New Mexican tradition mm -hmm. and call it breakfast. That's true. You know, so... So, uh, one time, one time I was in San Francisco. Well, this was when I was researching the book, um, The Legacy of the Wisecrack. And I go to this place called Okie Dog, not in San Francisco, it was in, uh, in Los Angeles, called Okie Dog. Okie Dog. Okie Dog. Like, like o Oklahoma Dog? Uh, like, o Okie o Dog. Like, like the, the... Like I'm an Okie from Muskogee? Like Tom Joe at Okie. Like an Okie from Muskogee? Do you know who Tom Joe is? Yeah, I know who Tom Joe is. Who's Tom Joe? Uh, Why do you got to do this to me? Because um, I don't think you know. I do know who he is, but I, don't, I can't. So I know the name. I'm going to be honest. I know the name, but I can't pinpoint who Tom Joe is. He's the main character of The Grapes of Wrath. There you go. Okay, so see? I fucking knew the name. He's Jesus a, Christ. He's an Oki. From Muskogee. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I think Eddie's a little buzzed. <laughs> anyway, where were we? Are you buzzed, Eddie? I'm not buzzed. Are you sure? Did you say bust? Buzzed. I used to be bust. From, I'm busted. I used to be bust from the North Valley to the Northeast. Yeah, Heights. whatever. Bust. <laughs> they made me sit in the back of the bus. Because I'm one of those Latinos who looks like a gringo. So you were basically on the short bus? Is that what the problem is? That's a problem. So, okay. so I I'm get a, kicked out of the family reunion told, be told, and I'm told to hang with my own. I love when it snows. Are we playing non sequitur or what? You know why? Why? Because my family's coming to visit. All these fucking flakes. <laughs> I'm like going, it's a family reunion! Yay! White girl thing. Okay. Um... So, interestingly enough, you brought up you teaching. So, where are you teaching right now? New Mexico Highlands University. So, you're still doing that. I thought you were at UNM a little bit. A little bit. Okay. And you're teaching, are you teaching comedy at both? Yes. So, when your students come to this class, what are they looking to get out of it, in your opinion? Uh, an American literature credit. Hmm. They're looking to check a box on a graduation form. Right, but do 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 they get anything out of it? Do you, oh, yeah. do, do you oh, find yeah. some of your students go on to to maybe even progressing into the com comedic world or Well, no, this is this class is not about comedy, training them to be comedians. It's training oh, well, them I know, but it's not training them to com be comedians, but you're teaching them a history of Well, not just a history, but a theory and mm -hmm. I'm providing them literary insights and giving them the tools to decode literature mm -hmm. and therefore American culture, the American ethos. Okay. You know, so I was just kind of curious about that because you were talking about a little bit about, you know, your your classes and, you know, what is it that, have have you had anybody that comes out that is goes into writing? Or? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Within the last six months. Mm-hmm. I've had three students publish novels. Amazing! My PhD is in creative writing. Uh, mine is not. Okay. My PhD is just that I took a vinegar bath. <laughs> a vine Why would you take a vinegar bath? Because it has pH in it. it. Raises my pH oh, level. I get it. I get it. <laughs> it's a bad thing. It's a bad joke. Bad joke. Bad joke. It really is a bad joke. Okay, whatever. Okay. I was going somewhere with all this before you interrupted me. Well, I mean, I was curious because you were talking a little bit about your class, so I was just wondering how. Do you use your books in your classes? No, uh, I think there there was a time when I did, but but because you can't find a textbook on stand-up comedy's literature, mm -hmm. I feel it's unethical to charge my students to buy my books. Uh, that makes sense. So what I do, well, in this class, in fact, in my American literature class this semester, the same thing happened. My students spent zero on textbooks, zero amounts of dollars on textbooks. They spent no money on textbooks. Oh, my God, that's amazing. 
I mean, one textbook could be one hundred and fifty dollars. Uh, most te- textbooks are about two hundred dollars right now. Yeah, easily, easily. Well, what I did is I put chapters from a couple of books, chapters that were pertinent to what we were studying. Mm-hmm. Like, where else are you going to find an article on Stephen Wright unless I wrote it? Well, unless Stephen Wright wrote it, and, you know, or somebody, well, somebody, somebody cool Wright wrote it. Is, yeah, Steve, somebody cool, not me. But if Stephen Wright wrote it, I don't think that would be fair game because I don't think the artist is always the best interpreter of the art. Well, I, I agree with that because so you record yourself other than watching you on video. I've watched you on video. Well, my classes. My Zoom classes are recorded. Are, are they recorded? Do you watch yourself? Do you go back no, and watch I yourself? No, it would be too damn painful. Really? Yeah. I, I mean, because... So, like, most of my shows, and I'm going to be honest with you. That's a first. Whatever. I'm honest with everybody. Um, I don't listen to a lot of my shows. But I have other people that listen to them and give me feedback. No, that's smart. You know, and, and, and tell me, oh, okay, that's a good guest. You know, hey, I really enjoyed that. I liked this part. Da, 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 da. You know, um, so, because first off, I hate the way I sound when I'm recording. I yeah. think I sound retarded. But I think that's most of us. Uh, I, I definitely think and, you sound retarded. And, and okay, that, was a that, joke. Is, that, that was is a an, joke. actually, that's an inappropriate word. I sound awkward. When I listen to myself. I agree. I think you sound awkward. Thank you. That's Thank a you. joke, Nikki. Thank you, feckin' feckin' fecker. No, no, I think I sound horrible. I mean, no, I, I'm serious. When I listen no, I to myself. No, I know exactly what you mean. I mean, you know, I mean, I think, I, I'm going to laugh at this because TikTok's just said, so the girl goes, calls up and says, hi, I was just calling to say I love you and have a good day. And then she plays back the message and it comes out like, hi, I was calling to say I love you. <laughs> That's kind of how you I feel when yeah. I listen to myself. Oh, yeah. I'm like, oh, my God, who the hell is that? <laughs> no, I, I think we're all there. We're, we all understand it. I'm my own worst critic. Well, see, I would be my own worst critic if I didn't have my ex-wife. Oh, yeah. I don't. I have three ex-husbands, so. Mm-hmm. I'm ahead of you. You have three ex-husbands? I do. Wow. I've been married and divorced three times. And you're still in the game. I don't know that I'm still in the game. I take one day at a time. Okay. But absolutely, yes. There are some of those times that you could say, yes, I could see myself 10 years from now here. Okay. With this person. So you're still in the game. Mm, I don't need, I don't know if it's in the game. It, you call it in the game if you're not like, you're not saying, oh my God, I, this is who I want to be. I want to be. I'm like, it's not sitting in a notebook writing my name a hundred times, Mrs. Blah, 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 blah. That would that, be a really strange name. That would fucking be an amazing name. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yes, that's me. That's me. That's your, I. Your children may not like it when you get to school. <laughs> yeah, because I would name them blah, 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a joke. So <laughs> here's a joke about my daughter. When, when my youngest was born, because I have two children... It was very funny because I used to give her a hard time. I said, you're lucky you weren't a boy. And she said, why? I said, because I almost named you Naren. She goes, Naren? Naren Farr. <laughs> <laughs> That's cute. I know. She would have hated me. Naren Farr. Not so far. <laughs> yeah, That's okay. Torture my children. That's what that's what our job is. I know. It's sad. So, but where do you think you are in getting your book book published? I think it's. I think we're, we're pitching it to the Pennsylvania State University Press mm-hmm. for their Humor in America series press. Uh, mm-hmm. for the, Humor in America series. Um, I think it's. A, I think it's insightful. I think I think for some people this book is a little bit too much. I cut a little bit too deep, so much that people think, "Well, you're really stretching that one already." 
And I've had people look at chapters and I think I'm utterly ridiculous. I've had other people. You haven't asked me to read a chapter. Would you read a chapter? Oh, you didn't never ask. I'm asking you now. Uh, you've never asked. Okay, yes, I would read a chapter. Okay, I'll send you a chapter. Okay, give me a chapter. The, the initial chapter where I, where I decode horse feathers. Okay. Do I have to watch horse feathers first? Should I watch horse feathers? No, first? the first first three pages are re, a recap of horse feathers. Okay. You've never seen horse feathers. I've seen the birth of a nation. Close enough for rock and roll. Horse feathers. Is you know, a, Birth of a Nation was a silent film. I know. Oh uh, my God, uh, Lillian Gish. What kind of dope do you think I am? There's lots of blackface in Birth of a Nation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I have it on VHS. You really don't think? I'm, I'm insulted, Nicolina. Why? You're gonna cry like a baby now? I'm crying like a baby right now. Give me a tissue. Anyway, is. what's this about Birth of a Nation? I have it. On no, we don't care about that. Either. Okay, we don't care about that either. We don't care about that. Just in case you didn't know. Okay. <laughs> what was your question? Oh, do you want to read the chapter of my book? Yeah, I want to read a chapter of your book. Yeah, I would. I would okay, some people think I'm just going too far, but I'm an academic. I'm trained to look at the. I'm trained. I'm tra- I'm like the fish who's trained to see the water. Well, it's not like you're writing a novel in in in. In respect of, in um, with the intent of it, like being a bestseller kind of thing. Well, I'd like for it to be a bestseller. Well, of course, but you're looking at it to be informative and to educate people. Yeah. Because I think that, in my perspective of you, your personality is you want to educate people. You want to teach people. You're you're no. you're, you're a natural teacher. What I want to do is I want to contribute to the evolution of a, a world consciousness. The universe is evolving through me and you, mm-hmm. through our consciousness. Well, sure it is. You say that like everybody knows it. Well, I know it. Well, you know it. That's all that counts. It's all about Nicolina. It is. After all, in me. Yes. It's Nicolina's world. We just live in it. Yes. I am the ruler. You're, well, give me more money, would you? <laughs> I'll work on that. Because I'm trying to give me more money, you know, because I invested in a gold mine once, apparently. And, you know, I'm, getting, I'm, I'm so stingy that I don't even give myself enough money to pay my bills. Okay. Okay. Where were we? We were talking about something, a substance. Book. A book. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm very proud of this book. I've worked very hard on it. Um, some people have read the first few chapters and thought it was brilliant. And other people's have read other people's people's other. That's the Menage a Trois talking. The Menage a Trois Mer- Mena- Merlot. Yes, we're drinking a Menage a Trois Lavish Merlot. By the way, yes. it's a night. It's a 2017. And this is my last bit of wine oh. for a while. I know. Okay, we're we're doing this. Okay. In any case, what was I? What we're, we're killing the fucking bug. What, what were we talking about, Nikki? So you're talking about your work and, and how you're proud of it. And... Oh, I'm proud of it. As an academic, my, my master's degree is in American studies. Mm-hmm. And one professor, this brilliant professor named Jane Caputi, she wrote The Age of Sex Crime. Mm-hmm. Brilliant book. Brilliant scholar. She analyzes culture and she, she looks at how we're basically a misogynist culture. I don't think that's news to anybody. Well, sure, exactly. But well, she really nails it down and makes a very, very clear point. And I, my master's degree is in American studies. So mm-hmm. basically, the way Jane Caputi explained it to us is, as an American studies scholar, your job is to be the fish who is explaining to the other fish the water in the fishbowl. Mm-hmm. And I feel that that's what this book does. Yeah. You know, I understand that. Other people, uh, the other fish can barely see the water. They don't even know the water exists. Right. But once you learn that it exists, you can get, you can have clarity. Right. And so that's what I'm doing with this book, and I'm doing it through the lens of the Marx Brothers, because mm-hmm. the Marx Brothers reveal so much about this culture. If you take a good, hard look at them, you realize they're not just talking about the Jew the Irishman and the Italian, they're talking about the Latinos like moi, mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. They're talking about the Greeks. They're talking about the gays. They're talking about the communists. They're talking about everybody. Right. And they're making it very, very clear that this cu- this is a culture where certain where the great majority of people are excluded, and a gifted minority, or not a gifted, but a privileged minority, are included. Mm-hmm. And they're they're just basically saying. We're gonna make. We're gonna. We're gonna torture you until you get over yourself. Right. I understand that. Yeah. So while I look forward to reading your chapter, well, why don't you read the whole damn book? Okay, and you can send it to me. Are you gonna send it to me? I will send it to you. I'll okay. send you. I'll send you the book. I'll send you the individual chapter. I'll send you whatever you want. Send me a chapter at a time. And if any of you want to. Any of your readers, any of your, not readers, your... Listeners. Listeners are interested in my book. Hit me up on Facebook. It's Eddie Tafoya, E-D-D-I-E, Tafoya. Or hit me up at comediologist at gmail.com. And I'd be happy to send you a chapter if you promise to give me feedback. I'll give you feedback. Well, not just you, but anybody. I was Ah. telling my creative writing students last night that... A good writer says, this is my work, don't change a word. Yeah. A great writer says, this is my work, help me make it better. Oh, exactly. I mean, for me, it's just like, um, you know, and, and it's, it's solely in the context of writing. So, like, when I write a joke and I, I hear people go, you know what you can do better? No. I don't want to hear what I can do better. But I want to hear that you're going to give me a suggestion to help me write it better. Yeah. So, uh, you know, because I'm not looking for to do your style of comedy. I'm looking to do, yeah. And I've, I've had comedians that come up and tell me that. And I'm just like, wow, that's, that's actually pretty good. And I think I'll, I'll use that. You know, because I think that, that you just got to have that open mind. Yeah. But you also have to have a good shit detector. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what Hemingway called it. Shit, shit detector. detector. He did not have one, by the way. Huh. He did not have a very good one. Mm-hmm. He produced a ha- to have and have not. And yeah. He should have been shot for that all the way along. But but I mean but I do think I do think that that, that that's the case. Is I, I like I like that philosophy of what you said. It's not you know about it being a, a a writer. The difference of the writer of. You know, give me your opinion to help me write better. Yeah, help me make it better. Yeah, help me make it better. See, because I always, I always tell people, I said, the thing is, is that I can make something and I can think it's amazing and it's great. But you know what? At the end of the day, there's always room for improvement. There's always room for growth. And see, I've been very lucky because one of my dearest friends, Camille Flores, is just the stellar editor she's just this great editor Mm -hmm. and she don't let me get away with nothing yeah she's just brilliant she don't let you not use not use words exactly she don't she don't let me not use. she don't let you not take talk like you know she don't let me not use no double negatives yeah exactly and she it's just it's just a joy to work with her because she doesn't she doesn't pull any punches Mm -hmm. You know. I'd rather you be brutally honest with me than sugarcoat it. Well, when it comes to certain things, when it comes to writing, when it comes to cooking, sure. when it comes to comedy, mm-hmm. tell me the truth. Tell me the truth. You know, that joke wasn't that funny. I found it a little offensive. If you're talking about the way I look when I walk into the room, bullshit me all you want. Yeah. But, you know, again, and, and I'm one of those people who's like, I, I want to hear, uh, you know, because, so like for me, when I tell my jokes, I tell my jokes to my friends and like. <laughs> Because, you know, they're the average people. They're not comedians. You know? Your friends are not average. Yeah, I know. My friends are not average. But you know what I'm saying. You know, it's like, it's a daily thing. It's like, okay, I want to use this joke. And it's like, okay, don't do that. It's like, are you sure? Because I also understand that a lot of us comedians have a little bit of a twisted, <laughs> twisted way of thinking. Right. right. That it sounds freaking amazing. And then when we get on stage, it's not. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. not well received. That happens. So that's why I like I do it on my regular friends, you know, my friends who are not comedians and say, right. So what do you think of this? Well, you got to work out your material. Yeah. There are some people who don't need to. Yeah, what? Because they're fucking amazing. Well, I worked with Freddie Charles the other day. 
Who's Freddie Charles? Freddie Charles is a local Albuquerque comedian. Do I know him? How come I haven't met him? You should. Freddie, Freddie is just as good a comedian. He, he wrote this bit about the difference between Colorado mm-hmm. and New Mexico. Mm-hmm. And he compared it to, to Danny DeVito and Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> twins. And he wrote this bit and he executed He writes it on the way between Albuquerque and Delta Colorado. Yeah. And What's his name again? Freddie Charles. I've worked with him a million times. I have to look at this guy. He's, he's a great guy. He's, he's just a great guy. But anyway, if I were if I were a lesser comedian, if he were a lesser comedian, he would have put the new bit of chunk of material after his opening. But he's such a confident comedian, such a competent comedian, that he begins his bit with a new chunk of material, which is generally considered a rookie mistake. And it just killed, man. It was just brilliant. You looking at Freddie Charles now? Yeah, I'm trying to see who this guy is. He's a great guy. February 12th. Freddie Charles. This guy right here? That one right there? That's Freddie. Okay. For those of you who can't see what she's doing, because this is an audio broadcast. Absolutely. She's showing me Freddie Charles' picture. Where'd you find it? Uh, it's he's on Facebook. On Facebook. Yeah. If you need a great comedian, contact Freddie Charles on Facebook. You never know. I'm hoping to. And, do and he's a good guy. He's a really good guy. I'm hoping to do a club here. You know, I just. No, Freddie would be a staple. I I think that that it would be good. You know, and like I said, you know, I, I talked to you about my plan and. Okay, are your listeners getting tired of of us? At six are minutes you? into. So what? Okay. We'll wrap it up. Just for we you. We don't have to wrap We'll wrap it up. up. We'll wrap it up. So, but look look for the book. It's not out yet, but... It's called The Marxist Revolution. The Marxist Revolution, which is the title of this podcast. How Chico, Harpo, Groucho, and Zeppo Changed the Way America Laughs. That's Absolutely. the subtitle. That is the subtitle. You know, I have that whole subtitle in the thing. Well, if you didn't notice. I noticed because I wrote it. Okay. So, but we'll see you again. Eddie will be back again because, uh, you know, my previous shows that I've done with Eddie have, we were lost. We were lost. You lost our shows? I, already, I told you that. That's why I was hoping you downloaded them. So. That hurt me in my heart. I'm sorry. Don't cry. Don't cry like a little bitch. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is Nicolina Nix, and you're here with me and Eddie Tufoya about his book. Uh, look for it. Title, Marxist. Revolution. Revolution. Uh, Chico, Harpo, and Groucho. Chico, Harpo, and Groucho, and Zeppo. Change the way America Also, look for his other books, Legacy of a Wise Crack. The Legacy of the Wise Crack, Stand of Comedy is a Great American Literary Film. Mm-hmm. Icons yeah. of African American Comedy. Yeah, because I'm t- trying to talk him into doing a documentary about that, and we're going to work on that. And don't so. forget my novel, Finding the Buddha. Finding the Buddha. A Dark Story of Genius, Friendship, and Stand of Comedy. Mm-hmm. So, look for any of those. You know, or just go to my Amazon page. Just go to his Amazon page, buy a book. Support support your local arts. Yeah, I don't care if you read it, but I do want you to buy it. <laughs> Have a great night. This is Nicolina Nix again, and we're signing off.